For those who, who don't know him, he's a senior research fellow here at IFBRI and has a, a, a huge range of, of work across re relevant issues on agricultural policy and, and trade over his career and uh, was previously at the World Bank in, in, um, in DEC working on agricultural is issues. When we come to, to Insight 5, um, <coughs> agricultural productivity reduces poverty in both small and in large countries. And I think here we have some quite surprising and diverse uh, in conclusions and interpretations. Many agricultural economists are actually concerned by the fact that agricultural productivity growth that's widely adopted, innovations that are widely adopted, will push down the, the price of food commodities. Um, and if you take the view that farmers, if you're thinking of farmers like well, Iowa farmers um, who sell all their output, clearly that can be a problem. Um, there's another perspective on this too, which is that, well, in Africa, and this is more the Collier Durkon point, um, that in the coastal areas, uh, perhaps agriculture will never acquire comparative advantage and it's not an area where um, it's a priority. Um, to, to innovate. That, that, that other interpretation which distinguishes and says, well, but you must do it um, in landlocked areas. And I think what we need to recognise is that it's clearly true that food prices fall if innovations are either globally adopted or if they're adopted in a closed economy context or a situation where uh, governments are focused on food security and they'll change, if necessary, the rate of protection to keep around food security. So innovations cause prices um, to fall. Um, now, in that situation, farm profits fall because elasticities of demand are very low for staple foods. Um, <clears throat> and so you're going to get less value of gross output from, from agriculture. Um, but we need to remember that lower food prices are going to benefit poor net buyers of food. And I think the key here is that most of the poor are either uh, farmers themselves or they live in rural areas. But what we need to remember is that these are not farmers of the type that we see in Iowa. These are farmers, mostly the poor farmers, are either net, small net sellers of food or actually net buyers of food. So even though food prices are going down, many of these farmers are actually better off as a consequence of the innovation that raises their productivity and the decline um, in food prices. Um, so what we do in, in this study, uh, Mara Savanik and I did, was to compare the small country case with a case where productivity gains are, are global. It's a case that's clearly relevant to the CGIAR system because the, the goal of the system is to secure very, very widely adopted gains. And it turns out that from our results that the poverty reduction gains are similar, but the channels through which they come are very different. Um, this diagram on the left is the one um, that Luke has shown us before. The higher, higher oh, this is 1% of GDP coming from agriculture industry services. Uh, you see a decline in poverty. For the poorest countries, it's about a 1% decline, 1 percentage point decline um, in poverty. When you move to a global simulation, the figure uh, on, on the right, you find a very, very similar result. Um, and that's despite the fact that food prices are, are falling and um, farm returns are, are going down. If you decompose this result to find out where it comes from, um, the two green bars are those associated um, with a situation, we use a set of countries, the 31 countries, um, we have this innovation occurring there, 31 countries where we have poverty numbers, and then the nine large economies. We have an innovation that's widely adopted um, and lowers prices, so agricultural um, uh, Sorry, it's widely adopted, but we're considering each country as a small, single economy. We're holding prices constant. So that's the experiment. Um, we add up the, the, the implications of that. 
agricultural profits rise and that the green bar is why the main reason the poverty falls under that scenario. Real wages also rise because agriculture in developing countries is such a labour intensive sector and that's another source um, of poverty reduction. If we turn to the, the orange bars, what we see is the, the big decline in poverty comes from a fall in the cost of food. Remember the two reasons why agriculture is particularly potent as a poverty reduction, channel for poverty reduction, are uh, that pro agricultural uh, uh, is labour intensive in developing countries and food costs are very high. Food consumption shares are very high for the poorest people. So that very high consumption share with the orange bar case where food prices are coming down, that's where the biggest reduction in poverty comes from. Agricultural profits are actually falling because the elasticity of demand is low um, and that's giving us an increase in poverty, but not a very large one because of the fact that so many small poor farmers are either net buyers um, or small net sellers. Um, there, are, there are increases in other profits, so if, if many um, poor households, say, run small uh, restaurant businesses, food service businesses, where their profits rise because food prices have fallen. Um, there's also a fall in poverty coming from the real wage increase, in this case uh, as well. And then there's another cost story here, which is really a numeraire uh, issue um, and probably not terribly important. Um, insight six, agricultural productivity pulls in underutilised household labour. Uh, Shaha Amran and Forhad Shilpi have a very interesting paper examining the impacts of agricultural productivity using econometrics, a panel um, in Bangladesh. They, they're very interested in so labour supply changes. And that's one thing that in, in the CGE modelling in particular we often don't have. Um, they're also very interested in a paradox that in Bangladesh agricultural productivity growth seems to actually reduce the importance of hired labour. So they use a three-year panel, 486 sub-districts sub of Bazila, um, 2000 through 2010. For a 1% increase in yields, rural wages go up by 0.9%. Labour supply by 0.4 of a percent. That's a very important linkage that we want to take into account. Um, and consumption by half of a percent. The biggest labour supply response in farm households, though, ends up causing a reduction in the importance of hired labour because the farm households, the demanders, um, are uh, actually increasing their labour supply. Um, the, the whole structural transformation issue, one thing that hasn't been explored to my knowledge um, is the implications uh, as you increase productivity you need fewer uh, workers in order to achieve the same level of output. Um, uh, the question is how, mu much, how much labour can you free up? How much labour can move out of the agricultural sector and the structural transformation key question is what's the elasticity of response um, of agricultural output to labour? That's an issue that hasn't been um, uh, discussed to my knowledge before. If it's high, agricultural output is very responsive to labour input and little labour can be liberated when you raise uh, TFP. Um, if it's low, you can liberate a lot of labour and that, that turns out um, to be very helpful. Now, uh, Marcus Eberhardt and Dietrich Wallrath use a panel of 128 countries over, f over a 40 year period to estimate the elasticity of agricultural output um, to labour inputs. They find elasticities that are much higher in the tropical regions than in temperate regions. As a consequence, it's much harder um, for tropical countries to transfer labour out of agriculture um, than it is for the temperate countries. This is a, an obstacle that we've not, I've not seen emphasised before um, and which can be a very important um, issue, I think, in the case, especially in the case of, of Africa. Um, one other uh, study, um, this is the one by Christopher Adam 
uh, Adam, Bevan and Gollan, they use a stylized CGE model of Tanzania to explore some of the key issues associated with economies with very high transport costs. And one of their findings, and this is very similar to the global uh, impact, the impact of global productivity gains, is that the benefits of infrastructure investments, the ones on which they focus, often accrue to people who are quite distant um, from the intervention. If you lower the cost of getting food to Dar es Salaam from the rural areas of Tanzania, um, the beneficiaries there are primarily poor uh, urban consumers with large, large food shares. Um, they, 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 and this is the, their, their point, that um, these investments raise agricultural productivity and, and often uh, provide uh, big gains to urban um, consumers. They focus on infrastructure and transport innovations um, and they find that the benefits are highly sensitive to, to the fact that the way they're financed. I think this is a, an important distinction from a lot of the literature focused on R&D, where R&D costs are so low relative to the benefits. In the case of infrastructure, we know from Schengen Fund's work, for instance, um, that the, the benefit cost ratios tend to be somewhat lower. Um, and so you have a lot more cost to acquire a certain level of productivity gain. One of the points that they find in this case is that the worst way to finance is through tariffs. These are highly distorting. Um, but that even when you can fund from foreign aid, you, you run into a problem with real exchange rate depreciation, which can have adverse impacts. Uh, Shin Shen Diao and Maggie McMillan find that foreign funding to finance infrastructure investment in Rwanda um, reduces productivity gains uh, in the modern sector by appreciating um, the real exchange rate. Um, so we have eight insights. I'm running out of time. Um, <clears throat> that ominous red numbers there. Um, these are, I think, really an interesting and important set of insights for organizations like IFPRI and the World Bank, and the CGIR system more generally, agricultural growth, more poverty reduction than growth elsewhere, the poverty reducing benefit go, diminishes as economies become stronger. Um, a lot depends on what other sectors you're looking at um, with agro-processing and transport often having very substantial gains. Um, the, the nutrition gains, very context specific and rather challenging as Derek Hetty would emphasize. Um, the benefits are not limited of agricultural productivity growth and not limited to landlocked countries or situations where food prices go down. There are gains whether food prices stay the same, a small country case, or whether um, they go down. This additional gain um, that Forhad Shulpi emphasized, underutilized household labor moving into market production is important and one underemphasized in the past. Um, this elasticity of output with respect to labor, an important issue that's not received any attention before, and the financing, the source of financing, something that really needs a lot of attention um, in the future, especially for investments in infrastructure and transport. Thank you very much.